Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Pottery Day. We have had a blast so far today. We've had so many wonderful guests already. And uh, today, as you can see, we are honored to have a whole uh, panel of wonderful veterinarians, the veterinarians who come from our advisory council. And you can read all about their bios on our website, but I'd like to give just a, a, a quick introduction uh, to each and every one, um, and including our Director of Product Development, Brooke Sloat. Say hello, Brooke. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We are super excited to have this distinguished uh, panel today, and uh, we're going to you know, quickly get into your questions and let you ask questions of these veterinarians. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about how we formed our advisory council, and I'll introduce each one. And then, um, and then before we dive into the first question, uh, I am going to do a drawing. So we are doing drawings every hour on the hour, and uh, I'll, I'll do that in just a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our Veterinarian Advisory Council. You know, one of the things that we, um, that one of the purposes for us in having an advisory council is to have a broad selection of veterinarians, and you'll find that, that, that all of these veterinarians come from uh, different parts of the country, different backgrounds, they have different expertise and fields. Um, and we also, uh, we, we also tap into the expertise of many other veterinarians and PhDs in animal science and pet nutrition and formulators um, and regulators to make sure that every product that we deliver comes with the utmost uh, care and precision and uh, efficacy and uh, legality, et cetera. So um, this, this group here is just uh, part of the group that helps all of Pottery come together, but we do value our advisory council because they have perspectives from the various practices and the various you know, walks of life that they, uh, that their disciplines that really help um, round us and shape us and uh, provide value um, to, you know, to our customers, to our home office team and to our pet pros. So with that, let me just uh, share a little bit. Let me start with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Welcome, Dr. Bernadine. Uh, she is a veterinarian at Laguna Hills Animal Hospital in Laguna Hills, California. And she's wonderful. She's done all kinds of uh, work, not only in California, but across the, the, the national media. Um, she got her uh, doctorate of uh, veterinary medicine at the University of California. Um, at Davis, and uh, and she's um, a wonderful addition to our advisory council. You'll see her in a lot of the videos, um, and she's done a lot of work with um, a lot of the media, you know, both radio, TV, etc., um, around around the country. So, you uh, everybody, give a, a virtual big shout out, uh, you know, applause, hello to Dr. Bernardini. All right, now let's um, give Dr. Tony a, a, an introduction. Uh, Dr. Tony owns 11 veterinarian hospitals in the Chicago area um, and, and also in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and he's the founder of Help Save Pets, which is an animal shelter that's helped save more than 15,000 homeless pets. Um, you know, Dr. Tony, he attended the University of Illinois uh, where he graduated with his degree in veterinarian medicine. And uh, he's been a, a wonderful addition to our advisory council as well. He brings the, the uh, um, a, a wonderful balance uh, and perspective, and you know the fact that he's got multiple hospitals that are that are functioning and practicing, and uh, is a, a wealth of information. We are, are very grateful to have you, Dr. Tony. So welcome. Big shout out to Dr. Tony. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You bet. Uh, next, let's go to Dr. Danny McVetty, and some of you got to hear Dr. Danny earlier today. I will also tell you that each of these veterinarians will have their own uh, uh, you know, special segment with just them, so you've got more opportunity to hear from them later in the day. We already heard uh, we get to have Dr. Danny visit with us earlier, but Dr. Danny is the founder and CEO of Lap of Love Veterinarian Services, and she is, um, has a wonderful practice that uh, has veterinarians all around the country as part of this organization that really focus on end of life care. And uh, she, so any questions around, you know, veterinarian hospice, 
um, or that that service um, is a, a great topic to ask Danny if you've got any questions on kind of end of end of life care um, and some of the wonderful services that, that she provides to so many and in a very kind and loving way. Um, we, we're, we're honored to have you, Dr. Danny, and uh, looking forward to some of the things that you will share with us today. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, last and certainly not least is Dr. Sandy Willis. We're okay. very grateful to have Dr. Sandy. Um, she is the small animal internal medicine specialist uh, for Phoenix Central Laboratory uh, up uh, near the Seattle area. Um, and Dr. Sandy, uh, one of the things that I think is just remarkable in terms of her accolades is she was um, awarded the Veterinarian of the Year in Washington. And that's a, a massive state with lots of animal care. Um, and to have that type of accolade, uh, in addition to so many other um, you know, experiences and, and success that she's had, that she brings uh, you know, with her perspective and uh, in her experience. So we're honored to have Dr. Sandy Willis as well. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sandy. Oh, thank you guys. We're looking forward to it. Well, with those introductions, I mean, what a panel of, of wonderful experts. Let's go ahead and do, um, now that you know our audience, I'm going to go to the drawing here and I'm going to share my screen just for a moment and share with you uh, some of the uh, prizes that are eligible here. So I've got, uh, we are going to draw three names. And you, if your name is selected, you can receive um, two of any of these bowls. You can pick two bowls. You can pick a bed, any of these beds, um, uh, any of our blankets. Uh, they're beautiful. They're luxurious. Um, they're wonderful. I've got many of these beds and blankets in our home. Um, and so you can choose any of those. That is um, what the uh, those who win this drawing uh, will have an opportunity to, to, and we'll send an email with the instructions. So I've got Karen here. Uh, she just sent me the winners uh, of this drawing. We've got three, and here we go. We've got Brendan Watts from Wisconsin. We have Margaret Bloomer from Colorado. And we have Steve Bredden from Illinois, right there in Dr. Tony's neck of the woods. So uh, congratulations to you three. We will send you an email at the end of the day, um, helping you know how to claim your prize. Um, and with that, Brooke, let me turn it over to you. We'll get some questions going. We've got the chat going already. I see lots of comments. If you have a question for one of our veterinarians, um, please put it in the chat. If there's a specific veterinarian because of their background, that you have a question for, um, indicate that. But if not, all of our veterinarians here are, are, are wonderfully equipped to answer your questions. And we'll uh, turn it over to you, Brooke, to, to take us away. Okay, well, there are lots of comments here, lots of shout outs. You guys are extremely popular. Um, there is a question from, uh, Elizabeth is asking a question for Sarah. Sarah says, I have nearly, I have a nearly seven year old fixed female cat who throws up her food on occasions a few times a week. Is it something I should be worried about? She also sleeps most of the day, but otherwise seems fine. What do you guys think? Sounds like an internal medicine question. <laughs> Thanks, Kai. <laughs> You know, you know, I think um, with anything with our pets is, is something that's abnormal from what they normally do um, is important to see your veterinarian. So is sleeping a lot. Cats sleep a lot. I mean, like, hello, I've been home a lot and they sleep a lot. But if it's something that's more abnormal, she's sleeping more, that could be, a, you know, a, just a subtle sign or it could be lots of different things. Cats do have digestive problems, bless our little hearts. They, they do vomit occasionally, um, and, but more vomiting than normal is potentially a sign that they, they need a better quality of food, but particularly if it's combined with not eating so well or, or losing some weight, might be a time to just, and seven's getting kind of middle-aged a little for a kitty, making sure that there's not something else going on with them. Again, it's knowing what's normal for, for your pet. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on that? Sandy, I totally agree with you. And one of the things I found with my own cats, 
it's really brushing them a lot. That makes such a major difference. And then the hairball formula that Paw Tree has, that helps too, because you can catch a lot of that fur and push it on through. And you're right, quality of diet makes a major difference. So when you see something different, go to your veterinarian first, because it may be just that you need to brush more and take care of those hairballs, or there could be something going on internally. Great question. Awesome. Um, I want to bring up a question um, because coronavirus is, is a, a big deal right now. And um, and we're home with our pets and, you know, we're kind of disturbing, you know, their sleep and things like that. Is there anything that you can share with us about coronavirus um, as far as any contagiousness, you know, from, vets, or from pets to people, people to pets? Um, you know, anything that, any advice we might want to give our pet parents because they're home in, you know, home a lot more with kids, et cetera? Yeah, and I, Brooke, I'll answer that as well, and anybody can chime in, is that our pets are really important to us right now. Um, we joke about the fact that we're spending a lot of time with them, so the dogs are joining the walk, uh, enjoying the walks, and my cats are like, Mom, you can see Tacoma from where we are. Would you walk over there and get back three days from now? Because they get along really well, but it's just, why are you here? Um, there's a lot we don't know about COVID, but um, but uh, we, we know enough that this is really a human disease. The social distancing between people is hugely important. Um, it, it is important, however, that, um, and we can be really safe about our pets, but if somebody in the household has COVID, and you know some people, ex, you know, asymptomatic people can shed it, you just really want to social distance with, with your pet. So if you're in a household and you have COVID and you have an older individual in your household, because there is some evidence that the virus can colonize. We've had a few, few, a couple of cats, a couple of dogs worldwide that we've cultured it from. And there's so much more we're looking at, but it's kind of a common sense sort of deal is if there's somebody in a household that has it, you know, let's social distance from the pet so they don't potentially give it to another family member. We don't have any incidents that we know of, of pets that have colonized it, giving it to a family member. But this is just being careful. We want to keep our cats indoors. That's good advice anyway. And as much as you can, we're opening up more. But, you know, trying to social distance the dogs a little bit, this is absolutely on the abundance of caution. Uh, diagnostic labs we routinely test for other respiratory diseases in dogs and cats. They're looking at the COVID virus. Very, very, very low incidence of it. But, but it's just in, important to just, again, if it's in the household, be careful. Otherwise, you know, our pets need our love and we need their love and, and just take good care of them. You know, an interesting anecdote, I do a lot of orthopedic surgery, and this kind of sounds crazy at first, but could coronavirus have caused more joint and orthopedic problems with pets? And at first you kind of go, absolutely not. But in the last month and a half, I have fixed more broken legs, ruptured ACLs than I have probably in the last six months. And I kind of look at that and go, most, so many people are getting new pets at this time. It's just, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. You know, if people are home, they have the time to take care of a new puppy. And uh, they're, you know, most of the time people would get pets like that and they're a fragile little puppy might be in a crate 90% of the time while people are at school and at work. Well, they're home all the time now. The kids are playing with the pets, sometimes relentlessly. And, uh, and also they're just more active and more time with the family. And we're seeing more incidents of injury kids stepping on a, a small puppy, dropping them. And so I just really be really careful. We're, we have a lot of these brand new pets at home and we got to really baby them and, and make sure they're they're safe uh, since we're spending so much more time with them. And uh, they're gonna get their rest too. I totally agree with both of my colleagues. And I think one of the things we also have to pay attention to is, is we all know about separation anxiety. And well, now they're not separated from us at all. And Sandy, yes, you know, it's like, can you leave now? I'm tired of these walks. I'm tired of being brushed, go away. <laughs> but we should try to keep them in their patterns. So when we do finally get through this lockdown, we're able to go back, our animals, and this happens after the summer too, when kids have been home with the dogs, the cats during the summer, or ferrets, whatever else you have, 
And now you leave and they go, wait a minute, where did you go? So getting them into their patterns, leave them alone for a couple of hours a day. Don't fuss with them all the time. Take them for more walks, maybe a little longer, but maybe not so many that uh, they're tired. And as Dr. Kramer was saying, they break things like, you know, their legs. But even things like the chillax, if they need something just to bring them on down, that would be wonderful. So keep them in their patterns. It's going to be so important when we finally get done with this lockdown. Thank you, guys. I think that's a, some great advice, some great answers. Um, okay, I have a question here, but I'm not sure. Well, anyway, um, Alicia asks, she's feeding her seven-pound, four-month-old Catan de Tulier puppy a third cup of paltry food twice a day along with a few treats throughout the day is this a good amount of food now i think it actually we, we would need to be looking at what exactly you're feeding which which diet you're feeding that would make a, a big difference in the answer but is there anything just in general you guys want to say or you know maybe i should have alicia write in a little bit more information to support i'll jump in um, I think that you're exactly right, Brooke. It's what the formula is because each mouthful of food is going to be a little bit different. And also a lot of it depends on the activity level. You may have a little baton that is just very subdued and take it very easy or is bouncing off the walls and you're taking it for all these walks. I really think it's so important that they always look like a dog and not like a snossage. So puppies, if they have fat puppies or fat kittens, they're more likely to have weight issues as they get older. So you always want to make sure that you can tell it's a dog. And how can you tell what it says on the label, what it says on the scale? Those are numbers. Put your hands on the side of the rib cage, up towards its backbone with a little bit of pressure. That's the operative word, little. You want to make sure you can feel those ribs. If they're sticking out, probably needs to eat a little bit more. If you're just like, uh, oh, there are the ribs, then it may be a little bit chubby. So you want to keep them slimmer because slimmer pets, when they're babies, are less likely to have weight issues when they get older. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question uh, from Alicia. Is there anything you would recommend for fatty tissue tumors on older dogs that are all natural? Um, that, has concern, uh, that has confirmed non-cancerous. Maybe from a surgical standpoint, I'll kind of take that on because, again, once they've had a, a some diagnostic work done, work done on a tumor like that where we find out it's benign, uh, I guess a lot of times there's a sigh of relief, of course, that it's nothing more sinister. But the concerns I have many times with fatty tumors is they continue to grow over time. And all too often, I'm sure all of us have encountered the pet that comes in with a you know, a, a fatty cell tumor that's a pound or two pounds or, you know, something enormous. And, and uh, you know, people aren't concerned about it because it's, it's not cancerous, but they do get in the way. They do, they do grow. They can eventually become necrotic and, and, and ulcerate. So it's so much easier to take these off when they're tiny. And so a lot of times I'll recommend that if a pet needs a routine dental cleaning or something that requires anesthesia to bring it to the vet's attention that you've felt these little lumps and bumps, and many times if they're dressed then, super simple to remove, much less expensive, easier on the pet, and they don't grow to become enormous and, and become a major difficult surgery that uh, is much more hard on, and more difficult on the pet. Yeah, if I can weigh in as working for a diagnostic lab is that a lot of people, we feel it about our, ourselves. You feel something, you're worried about something, you think it's the worst thing ever, and you just wait to see a doctor. and seeing things early on, a lot of lumps and bumps are, are not metastatic disease and we can take care of them so much sooner until their eight pound two, fatty mass on a seven pound chihuahua. It gets really challenging for the best surgeon. So, and I know it's been a bit challenging. Veterinarians are doing curbside right now. It's a little bit slower with being very careful with social distancing, but we are concerned about the longer people don't see us, the more significant, even something really easy can be. So we're here as veterinarians to help anybody. It just give us a call. A lot of times it's not anywhere as bad as you think it is um, and you feel relieved or if it is, you catch it really early and, and that's just really important. That's great. Great point. Great point. 
Okay, so I've got another cat question from Nancy. She says, hi, I have a one-year-old cat who had severe eye infections as a kitten and almost lost one of his eyes. Um, his third eyelid is damaged and he still gets recurring eye infections. Any pet pro any pottery supplements, I think she meant to say, any pottery supplements that would help keep his eyes as healthy as possible? Pottery supplements for eyes. Well, I think that a lot of these sadly are going to be viral diseases that will continue to haunt the cat the rest of its life. Either one, the virus continues to come back, herpes virus, people get them, those fever blisters that keep coming back whenever you get stressed. But there's other viruses that can also affect them and it may just be a damaged third eyelid. So keeping the eyelids clean, keeping the eyes clean are important, but keeping the immune system nice and strong. So probiotics, you know, those are things that can really be very helpful. Awesome. That's really awesome. And, uh, um, speaking of probiotics, you know, we, we have the Gastro Pro Plus, which mm -hmm. is a probiotic and a prebiotic. And Dr. Bernadine, when you said um, uh, immune system, you know, the I would think that the uh, superfood seasonings with all of the, uh, the, the, the popcorn and superfood seasonings with all of those antioxidants may also be helpful for the immune system. You're exactly right, Roger, because our largest immune system in the body is the GI tract. So if you're keeping that healthy with good food, good supplements, and the probiotics, you're way ahead of the game. Yeah, and taurine is also, which is in our food, uh, you know, best, especially our cat food, but that also helps with eye health. So that's, you know, with, with, a, good, with a good solid food. Um, okay, another cat question, you guys. Um, my Natasha writes in, my cat's breath stinks, and no matter how often or not I give her a bath, her fur stinks too. She's on a uh, grain-free food and uh, grain-free food, and I give her greenies treats daily. How can I change this stinkiness? Is it the food? Danny, Stinky. go for it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I'm the right one to do this. <laughs> not, not this question. Sandy, do you have anything? Like, doing hospice care, I don't, I don't usually have to have these conversations. The, 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 the bad breath is not the topic they that you get. Don't care about the bad breath. <laughs> okay, they all have bad breath, but the clients just don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I would say that I don't know about the hair coat, but I always worry about dental disease. I mean, cats, puppy breath is lovely. Cat breath, never so good. Um, <laughs> But if they, no, they knock a moose over at 20 yards. But, um, but, but dental disease, dentistry has gotten huge in our profession and cats get dental caries um, and so, and gingivitis and they get a lot of mouth disease for which the immune status is important. But sometimes we, we really need to look at the teeth and make sure the dental status is okay. Um, I don't know if, if, if Bernie or Tony, if you have any thoughts otherwise in terms of Food. But Sandy, wouldn't you agree that if the teeth are really bad as they're grooming themselves, they're yeah. leaving all that stinky saliva, you know, back on their body. But yes, taking a look at the cat's teeth is not the easiest. Don't just look at the guys up in front. They always look good. But the ones back here, they build up the most tartar. So don't even open your cat's mouth. Just pull up the lip towards the ear. Look at these teeth back here. They should look white, bright, shiny. If they look like there's concrete on them and the gums look red and inflamed, they need to have their teeth cleaned. And oftentimes people say, well, I had it done last year. Well, that's nice. I brush, I floss, I use an electronic toothbrush twice a day and I still have to go in four times a year and have my teeth cleaned. So I don't care what you're feeding, it can help, but professional dental care is of paramount importance. And after dentistry, if the mouth smells beautiful, you know what the problem is. And when it starts to, I have a young cat that just has more dental problems. And, and when the mouth gets stinky again, she just needs to go in more often, sort of like people do. I know owners are uh, afraid about dentistry because we need to sedate our pets to, to really do a good job of taking care of their teeth. Uh, but one thing we find too, statistically, is our kitty cat friends are not coming to the veterinarian as often as they used mm -hmm. to it. When we talk about three-year vaccines and some things like that, that that might delay that physical exam, it may mean that our cats are only getting looked at every three years, four years, and that could be some, you know, almost like us having our teeth looked at, you know, every 20 years, and that that is just obviously going to be an issue and, and allows 
dental di disease to get out of hand. And then when we do deal with it, it's going to be way more major than actually just cleaning their teeth and keeping them healthy. That's that's awesome. And it, it is. It's very hard to take cats to the vet, right, to get them in the car, to get them, you know, so I, I think that's probably why people don't always bring them or as often as they as they should. Um, I am continuing to scroll people right. All of them, you guys, but we're going to do our very best. Uh, but there are dozens of questions right now. But, uh, so we'll, we'll keep moving. OK, I am. Roger, if you're seeing, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm wondering if I'm missing something here. There, there could be. Um, let me. There's a I'll, ton I'll, of I'll, shout outs. They're, 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 they're so interspersed. Oh. Everything else, sir. Yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. Okay, I've got one from Joey. Um, she says, "How important is it to have good nutrition for our dogs and cats?" Very good question. Who would like to feel that? Since that's the name of the game. <laughs> well, I, I guess I can briefly take it since I haven't contributed too much. Very important. Period. <laughs> <laughs> good, good nutrition good is, is incredible. Yeah, and it's 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 but it's it's important for reasons that we don't always think about. You know, it's important for for the entire function of the GI system. It's important for skin health, teeth issues. It's important to ward off any genetic issues that might happen because you don't have proper balanced nutrition. So there there are some you know lines of thinking out there that they think well you know we're going to cook our own food, and I'm certainly not saying that that can't be done properly. I'm just saying it's very hard to, for it to be done properly. So when you have a balanced food like pottery that you know has scientific background, that you know has been studied and looked at and supported, you know you can feel good that you're feeding the right um, diet to your pet with all the essential nutrients that that um, that are in it. Cats and dogs need different essential amino acids, and when they're essential, that means that your body cannot produce them on their own. So cats and dogs have different essential amino acids that they need, which is why it is important to have the proper feline diets, the proper canine diets, and um, and, and then any supplements that, that can, you know, that can be added on, on top of that. So it's very important. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry, anybody else? One of the things I always say is diet, genetics, and luck. So you can't do a lot for the genetics, you know, blame it on mom and dad. Uh, that would make a major difference as to how we age, diseases we get, uh, luck, you know, how many of us buy lottery tickets and we're still doing what we're doing. But then there's diet. And yes, that's so important. And people, as you know, Dr. McBetty was saying, let's go ahead and just make our own food. It is so difficult to get a properly based diet. I always say if I could just go to the grocery store and pick something off the shelf that had everything that I needed, and it tasted good, boy, it would be so much easier than going something from column A and something from aisle B. So having a great quality food that has good ingredients, that has the science behind it, that's the genetics. That really, That's the diet. That really makes such a major difference. Love that. It, it really, oh, I'm sorry. Go I was going to say with pottery, you know, your basic diet, you, you've got the basics. You've got a strong you know, well-balanced, you know, research diet. And then with the paw pairings, you know, you, you get a chance to play around in many different ways to, to change, you know, change up the flavors a little bit. You know, we occasionally work up animals for gastrointestinal disease. And the, the first thing we ask is what's their diet? And if it's not a good quality food, we may do some general blood work just to make sure everything's okay. But then making sure they're on a good quality of food, it's amazing how much that makes a difference. The, the food really does make a difference. And um, I have to say with, with our food, I mean, it, it's a very good, it's a very high quality food because we put a lot of extra stuff in it because we wanna make sure that we're hitting everything. We're hitting heart health and eye health and joint health and bone health. And I mean, just, you know, we have, we have 20 claims we've talked about before, 20 claims uh, about our food and you know, it's every claim you make, you have to prove. And every time you make a claim, it costs money. But we, when we designed this food and developed this food, it was all about hitting on all the things that were most important for pet parents, the, the things that they go to the vet clinic for most often. So we're trying to keep the pets as healthy as possible 
But as everyone knows, even with us, when food is processed, some of the goodness is cooked out of it. So supplementing is, is a huge addition. And just as we supplement our diets with vitamins and, and minerals and things like that, we need to do that kind of stuff for our pets. And if you try stuff, it really does make a difference. So I'll, I, I know you guys all want to hear from the vets, but I just had to say my thing. <laughs> so... <laughs> Brooke, I, I can uh, jump in with a few quick questions that maybe we can just rattle off because uh, get, get some answers to because I've got a few that I think should be pretty quick to answer, but uh, but that's I, I guess it's easy for me to say because I'm not the veterinarian who has to answer it, but this one I don't know anything about, but there's a question from Melissa that says, seven-year-old uh, schnoodle experiencing intervertebral disc disease, any recommendations? Keep them skinny. That's <laughs> I always think about the the spine like a bridge, especially in a pet where they have two front legs and two back legs. And the more weight that that bridge has to hold up in the middle is, is going to put more stress, stress and, and uh, cause more damage to, uh, to the back and to those intervertebral discs that, that are cushioning the back so nicely. So keeping them thin is a really, really big issue. And uh, you know, active and healthy, and, and that is, is important. But I find that probably one of the biggest complicating factors to uh, dogs who have back problems is they're overweight. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, even if they do go under for surgery, that overweight is gonna even cause them to not be able to heal it quickly as well. So that's that's important on both sides. There's a lot of surgeons, I don't know about Dr. Tona, that don't, that won't even, um, won't even, you know, go under surgery if the weight isn't kind of fixed, so. Wow. And as Tony was saying, Dr. McVetty was saying, keeping their weight under control, yes, is important, but then you want to try to keep these other joints as healthy as possible, as long as possible. So a lot of the joint supplements, you know, Joint Pro Plus that you folks have, Pawtree, it's wonderful. It won't do anything likely for that disc that's affected, but if you can keep the other ones healthy, you can keep that support system. As Dr. Tony was saying, you know, keeping that bridge nice and strong, that's going to make a major difference too. Great comments. This is uh, that's amazing. I, I learned a lot in that short, those short answers. Thank you. I'm seeing one here from Roxanne. Is there something I could give my ten-year-old Yorkie with Cushing's? Love the correct medication. Keep its weight under control. Keep its immune system strong because Cushing's is an overproduction of steroids, basically in the body, and that can do havoc for the immune system. So the Gastro Pro Plus definitely couldn't hurt. But seeing your veterinarian, keeping in touch with your veterinarian. Dr. Sandy? Yeah, there's not a dietary support, like Dr. Bernie said, is really in, important in keeping them healthy. It, it is an overproduction of, of steroid hormones. And so it is needs to be treated. There's some holistic ways to treat it, but yeah, the, the best treatment today is you have to go see your veterinarian, get it properly diagnosed. And then it's something that we really need folks to monitor their dogs. Um, cats don't get this very often in terms of making sure their appetite's okay while they're on the drug. But it's it's tricky, but it, it can be treated. Our, our medical treatments for it have really advanced in the last few years, and we have better treatments than we used to. Um, thank you. We've, we've got Catherine who writes in, at what time is it best to fix my German Shepherd? He's currently eight months old. A lot of, going to be a lot of controversy there out in, yeah. <laughs> in the public. Um, I mean, I, there, there, there's anecdotal evidence in, in, in certain breeds that early neutering might uh, cause some orthopedic uh, issues. And um, I, I, I have a I have a little bit of issue with that that I don't think there's uh, that there's a lot of uh, information to back that up and and uh, but there you know certainly have have been situations so you know in a, in a large breed animal especially a German Shepherd with that are known to have a lot of uh, orthopedic issues like hip dysplasia I certainly would uh, would say don't push it to pediatric neutering but uh, in a situation like that you know after six months uh, I think is certainly going to be healthy. You know, the longer we wait, I think sometimes the incidence of some other side effects of not neutering a pet starts to rear their ugly heads. And sometimes an intact male German Shepherd dealing with aggression uh, or something like that caused by increases of testosterone in their body could be a way more detrimental situation 
to that pet's future than than hip dysplasia. So you got to be careful with that. So I think I think uh, you know talking to your vet, seeing when they feel most comfortable to do it. Maybe not pushing the the limits of having them neutered super young when they're large breed dogs with hist with uh, the possibility of uh, of some of those orthopedic issues is probably a really good idea. Awesome. Um, I'm seeing one here um, from Joe. My dog's fur, some of it ha has gone all fluffy, like like downy, um, rather than like hair. So maybe more like a rabbit fur. Um, it causes it to mat much more easily. Uh, he's on the salmon oil. Is there anything else that you would recommend to get his hair uh, back to normal, basically? You know, it almost sounds to you guys like, I don't know what the age of the doggy is, of course, but it may be an endocrine problem. I think the dietary supplements would help, but getting it, that's kind of like a puppy coat. So we talked about Cushing's before hyperadrenocorticism. Um, thyroid, maybe. There's some other hormonal things, but allergies wouldn't. I, it makes me think endocrine, which is would be that, that would be, again, checking with the veterinarian and 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 having a, a full look at it. That would be seen more in older animals. Um, but yeah, and there's some other endocrine imbalances that are little sex hormone imbalances that we sometimes treat with other medications. I, I know we, I think we have some melatonin in some of our products, but um, but um, but that would probably be at a higher dose. But um, yeah, if your salmon oil isn't really helping, I, I would have an appointment with a veterinarian see what they think. Yeah, I, I, there's some, there's not enough information here, Joe. So, you know, as far as age of dog, type of dog, etc. So anyway, I think that's, that's great advice. Um, I'm still scrolling. Anything? From your, uh, Cassie says, why does my cat chew plastic? She goes insane to chew any bags like candy wrappers, cat treat bags, etc. Never seen a cat do that. She will come out of nowhere if she hears it. <laughs> I actually had a cat like that. I did have a cat like that. He would eat a garment bag, you know, the plastic ones when you when you take them into the from the bottom up and any plastic bag anywhere. And I just had to make sure that I didn't have any plastic anywhere that he could get into because I that that can cause an obstruction. I mean, when I walk on the street, I'll pick up a twist tie on the ground because I'm so used to cats with little foreign bodies. But I don't know if you guys have found a reason, but it just seems like a little um, idiosyncrasy of this kitty, and you're going to have to use paper bags. <laughs> Be careful. My cats yeah, do don't want them chewing a bunch of it. Yeah, my cats were crazy and did the same thing. So I, I, And mine does it also. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a cat. I have too many kids. So. <laughs> don't let them eat plastic bags either. I, I was going to say, no. <laughs> Yeah, animals, would, animals would get into pica, you know, these weird things. So some cats like to suck on wool because some people think that it, you know, smells like their wet mommy's tummy when they were nursing and they like plastic. The one that I just showed you right now, if I have a little hair tie, oh my goodness, she loves those things. She should choose that. It's like, oh no, you don't. I am not pulling that out of your tummy. So yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a little like a small worm or a mouse tail or something like that, you know, like a small prey that they can fit in their mouth. I mean, we don't know why. We don't know. <laughs> Brooke, Some questions to life you'll never answer. <laughs> I have one here from uh, from Laurie. She says, I'm an adult that is in college. And so because of that, I moved to a dorm and then back to my parents' home sometimes for a little bit. So this is a question about uh, potentially separation anxiety. Uh, my dog experiences really extreme separation anxiety when he lives with just me at the dorm, but when we live at my parents' home, he has no separation anxiety when people are out of the house. Why is that? Um, and the speculation, could it be because, you know, uh, when I'm at my parents' house, there's usually someone always at home, and uh, before the virus, um, at the max, it was like four hours alone at home, you know, all by themselves. A any thoughts on on that? Well, well, I agree with those behavioral questions. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is right because when it's just the two of you together, you and your dog, the dog is like you are its entire life, its entire focus. And all of a sudden you're gone. It's like, whoa, where did you go? When you're with your parents back home, maybe that's where you and the dog grew up. The dog goes, oh, I can go outside. I have a good time. I got grandma here. Grandma takes care of me. 
I get a little extra treats from grandpa, life mm. is good. So sadly, it, it's not impossible, but it would be difficult to break some of that behavioral attachment to you. So you need to do it slowly. Even when you're there in the dorm, maybe you say, okay, you're going to be over there in the corner. I'm not going to give you lots of attention. I'll still give you some. There's medication that you may need because they can truly go through panic attacks. If it's mild, something like Chillax may work perfectly, but if you're finding that's just not doing it, you don't want the dog to hurt itself mentally or physically. So see your veterinarian. You may need to have a consultation with a board certified veterinary behaviorist. So totally different than a trainer. Trainers come sit, stay. They can give you some ideas, but you can try Chillax. You may need more. Try to build up that dog's confidence level. Awesome. Um, Kathy writes in, I have a barely over a year and a half uh, English bulldog and American pit bull diagnosed with atopic dermatitis allergic to fleas and had a sarcoptic mange breakout at six to seven weeks old. We've tried everything uh, for her skin condition, cannot afford the $100 per month allergy shot. Brevecto didn't even work. Um, she scratches, licks, and practically eats herself up. Her hair is missing on her sides and paws uh, because she chews all the time. Her stomach is so very red, hot, and irritated. We don't know what else we can do. Help. Mm, not me. <laughs> it, sounds like, it sounds like a terrible allergy problem. I mean, again, there's a lot more that needs to be uh, dug into to get a definitive diagnosis, but if the animal's that itchy and, and, and possibly that allergic, um, you know, I know some of the newer medications, like you're talking about that with this allergy shot, and some of those things have been miraculous for pets who we just could not get a handle on really, really tough, itchy allergies. Um, but, and again, some of those things, because they're newer technology and that they are expensive. And so, especially with the, with the bigger animals. So, um, you know, talk to the veterinarian. This is definitely a medical case that needs to be dealt with. I don't, I don't know that, um, you know, again, if a, little, if a dog is just a little itchy once, once in a while or has a little dry skin once in a while, supplementation is fantastic for that. And, uh, and, that can, and that should probably be used here in this case, too, uh, to help reduce the amount of medication that you might have to use. But this sounds like a medical condition. There are cheaper medications that can be used in that $100 shot. Some of them are along, come along with some more side effects in that, but you know, touch your touch base with the veterinarian because there are definitely other things to try to get that dog some comfort besides uh, these most expensive new technology, big guns that, that, uh, that we pull out very often in cases that are tough like this. My concern if the scabies is still there, you can do every other type of treatment. You have to get rid of that scabies. And it can be difficult to find it sometimes. It's an organism that lives under the skin. It's also contagious to people. So that would be my major concern. You said it had scabies. Make sure that's gone. That would be a paramount. Yeah, very, very itchy. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's really great advice. Um, Leanne writes in, uh, we have a new great Pyrenees puppy. I've seen this puppy, it's adorable. Uh, seven weeks and I'm adding his old food to his new pottery food. How long should I transition him? I, I'm not seeing there was, I think she had something else but it's not it's cut off. Um, so how long for a transition? Um, we, we usually say you know a good five to seven days, um, gradual transition, um, sensitive tummy could be 10 days, is there anything else? I mean, um, Gastropro Plus might be very helpful with a new puppy transitioning, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's something that's, that's really important to be aware of because that, that transition in general is just so important because of the fact that nothing can be <laughs> off a diet change like an owner given a new diet and having the dog or cat break with diarrhea that comes for transitioning, trans transitioning a dog a cat from their dog, their food to pottery, same as it is for a veterinarian putting an uh, animal on a, a diet that they really need to be on for a medical condition. And uh, many of those pet owners kind of take it emotionally. They, they feel like they gave the pet the food and then now the dog breaks, the dog or cat breaks with diarrhea. It's kind of their fault. And sometimes they secretly just don't feed the food. And so that, that time frame is, is so important. I think from an exact standpoint, I, I don't know, but a week's probably a, a really nice 
uh, a guideline to go by. And certainly as uh, if you were doing it too quickly and they did uh, revert to some software stool or something, you could prolong that to up to a couple of weeks. And I think that should be plenty of time to get the body's enzymes used to the new nutrients that are, that are coming into the body. Uh, for, for Dr. Danny from Alicia, <laughs> Lap of Love available in every state. You may want to just mention what, what your business is, Danny, and Lap of Love uh, Veterinarian Services. If not, how do we get it in every state so we don't <laughs> say goodbye in the cold vet office? I know. I saw that uh, that question come through, Alicia. Thank <clears> you. <throat> you know, um, it, we aren't in every state yet, but that is the plan that we would be in every state. And then hopefully one at some point in the future, we'll be in every country. Um, but uh, but I agree. It, it should be the way that it's done. Um, if we don't have one in your state, we're in 31 mm -hmm. states right now. So if we don't have one in, in your state, then we're trying. Um, this is all limited by the number of veterinarians that are out there. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but there is a you know shortage of veterinarians. We're just simply not graduating enough to fill all of the jobs that are out, out there. I think Banfield has 20,000 job openings, something like that. Oh, so okay. it, yeah, it's it's everywhere. We just, you, you can't hire enough veterinarians. So um, yes, Ariel, I see your question. We are mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. We have a couple of wonderful doctors in Boston and I think in another location in, in, um, in Massachusetts as well. So we're getting there one day, one day. So if you, um, if anyone would like to go in on starting a veterinary school and graduating with students, that'd be great. So <laughs> there are new schools coming on board. There oh, are. You know, we got a couple of new ones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's wow. keep open, send uh, new veterinarians Danny's way to help build that practice so we can have them in all states. And uh, 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 it's a wonderful service. Thank you. Yeah, it's a fantastic I'll service. Take, I'll take a couple too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sure Dr. Tony needs to hire some also. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, okay, so next, Holly writes in, I think my dog is having an allergic reaction to the new heartworm flea intestinal parasites meds my vet put her on. Is there a way I can naturally detox her? I'm switching her back to previous meds. Detox, natural detox. Mm. For, I'd say well, most of these medications have a fairly short half-life in the body. So my question would be, what's the reaction that you're seeing? Is it itchy skin? Is it an upset stomach? Um, a little bit of vomiting right after giving the medication? If you're seeing something like that, it may be just a drug reaction and one that if you just don't give that particular medicine and it did well on the previous one, great, you're right. Go back to that previous medication, but let your veterinarian know. Yeah, it's very we'll good. Probably point. have time for maybe two more questions or three if they're really if they're really short. Okay, I'm looking. I'm scrolling. Got lots of call out. Yeah, call outs here. Well, here's one. I see my dog is one. Uh, this is Julie. Did we? I don't think we did this. My dog is one year and four months. Uh, he will jump and grab your hand with an open mouth and his teeth. Itchy. How can I stop that? I'm afraid it could hurt somebody. Uh, he also just started growling and snapping at us maybe twice now, uh, but it's never been like him. I can take things away from him and he's great. Uh, and then it runs out. Uh, it sounds like more of a behavioral uh, issue, um, but any, any thoughts from any of you in, in understanding that? I'll just throw in there. If he isn't neutered already, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes these aggressive type things are just uh, normal tendencies from intact male dogs. So number one, make sure that's going on. It was a younger dog. I'd say it was still teething and it's just being a squirrel. If it hasn't had training, yes, you definitely need to have a trainer. But I think dogs really do understand body language and tone. So if you tell your dog, I love you, but and how you're saying it, they understand that. So if, you know, don't tease it, don't hit it in its face and try to roughhouse with it by hitting its face. A lot of people do that thinking it's cute, nah, 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 you know, hitting it. No, don't do that. And if it does bite your hand, scream like it was the most painful thing you've ever felt and leave the dog alone. I do not want to play with you. You hurt me. I'm done with this. Just like a mommy dog would do too. Just, nope, I have nothing to do with you. The trainer. Yeah. Yeah. You see some others, Brooke. I see a few, a few more. I, I, 
I've got one here. I'll go with this one uh, real fast. Do you, re Christina asked, do you recommend any vitamins or supplements for dogs? My dog is two years and healthy. We just want her to stay that way. I know my answer. <laughs> what you you <laughs> well, I think, I think pop herrings would be the thing to be on. It gives, you know, extra vitamins, all kinds of nutrition um, for the pet. Um, obviously a solid food. But any anybody have any other the, the, the salmon oil and the, the salmon oil supplements are, are just awesome. I mean, if, if anybody asks me, like, what should I give my dog? I'm always like, that's one of the best things you can give. It's the skin, hair, nails, joints. It's it's everything. It just helps keep everything good, you know, and it's going to do no harm either. Not that any of the products that we have aren't, aren't all, you know, all natural. But I think to me, it's, it's, it's the best if you're going to do something. You want to do one thing. That's it. Our mothers were correct when they said cod oil is good for you. So yeah. cod liver oil, hated it. Salmon oil, good stuff. I take mine every day. As do I. And I take a probiotic every day. And my dogs get one or a gastro pro plus every day. Yeah. Okay. Roger, that would have been the second choice. Yeah. Do you have yes. one more? Oh gosh, I feel bad, you guys. We can't get through all these. I know I see several that we that we haven't gotten to, but you know, it's just been such a great discussion. And we've got another one coming up here uh, at the top of the hour, and so we've got to jump off so we can give Dr. Bernadine a chance to, to get a glass of water before we uh, uh, have her go deep on the next topic, which is cognitive issues. We're going to talk. Oh, about there you go. Some cognitive health and so forth. But um, I guess let's see. I saw. Um, where was uh, Kathleen? I have a 14 year old lab. He's on joint support and uh, gabapentin daily. His elbow is bone on bone, according to an x ray. Any other ideas how to treat when he can barely put weight on his front leg? So I'll kind of take this, and maybe Tony can take a little bit from an orthopedic standpoint too. So the gabapentin is fantastic, it's absolutely fantastic. And however, if it's not touching the pain, you might need to increase the dose. And you can actually start at around three mg per kg of gabapentin, and we can increase it up to 30 to 50 mg per kg. So my point is it can increase 10 times the original dose, just simply because we need to keep that, we, we need to, to keep the medication built up in the system. So you never want to go off it, it's, and it's something you need to be patient with. Once we put our patients on gabapentin, sometimes there's a little bit of sedation that happens, they get tired. But if that does happen, you back down the dose a little bit, and then you can creep it up if, if the pain hasn't been, um, if the pain is, isn't being subsided. So talk to your veterinarian about increasing that dose um, just to help try to keep the pain in, in, you know, contained a little bit. There are other medications that can be added as well. So, so definitely talk to your veterinarian, talk to your veterinarian about those. Um, but, uh, but I, I would encourage you to understand that you're not going to be able to grow cartilage material. You know, you can't just have it just immediately grow. So at some point, this is going to become a quality of life issue. And then, you know, that's where you can visit our website or email me me and, and I can help you through that next phase. But um, but the first number one right now is just simply about making sure you have the right medication and the right dose as well. And I'll just add quickly is that, uh, again, like we said there, just using a combination of, of therapies is, is amazing. You, if you have gabapentin going and you add a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. to that and you have a, a nice natural supplement, it's, it's hopeful that you could use a lower dose of all of each individual and have a safer, safety, better safety margin uh, as you have to increase those to, uh, to keep a pet who's got a severe osteoarthritis problem. Going on. And keeping them light, even things like cold laser therapy, there's underwater treadmills that can help. So there's really a lot of a multimodal way of doing it. And oftentimes when these diseases progress, as you're saying, yes, you need to do multiple different things to keep them comfortable, not just one thing. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I, I'm going to just, there, there, I'm not going to answer this, but I'm going to refer Zoe ask the question. My great Dane has been getting hot spots since we moved to California. Any ideas how to treat that? Uh, Dr. Danny gave a wonderful segment uh, earlier today that you could go on, on uh, our Facebook page and watch on the allergies. Um, she talked about many different, uh, <clears throat> but one of them is our skin support plus, which is a wonderful spray that can help with hot spots. Uh, but there's a whole, but for anybody who's got more questions on allergy, uh, go back and watch. You just happen to have it. Just happen to have it. Uh, but Dr. Danny, you did a great job on that. And I will tell you guys, we've got some wonderful uh, deep dives we're going to take with each of these veterinarians. Let me give you a little bit of the lay of the land here. Um, so in just five minutes, we'll be back with Dr. Bernadine. 
on cognitive issues um, in senior dogs um, at, at two o'clock central. Uh, after the, the next hour, we will be on with Dr. Sandy and she will go deep with us on anxiety and occasional aches and discomfort. Um, at three o'clock central, we'll have Dr. Tony on a deep dive session on digestive health, which will be wonderful. Um, at four o'clock, we've got an earn an income session and we've got a special guest with Matt and Trisha Deming who will help us understand how poetry can be a wonderful uh, source of income in your life. At five o'clock central, we've got, we'll, we'll be back on with Dr. Cruz, Dr. Bernadine, uh, to talk about bladder issues in dogs and cats and hairball issues in particular with cats. Um, at 6 p.m., we'll go deep on joint support, um, uh, joint health and uh, uh, hip, joint and hip health, and that will be with Dr. Tony uh, at 6 p.m. Central. At 7, we'll have Dr. Sandy back uh, to talk about pet food seasonings and uh, some of these, you know, the vitamins and minerals that can be uh, found in, in uh, those uh, sources. And at 8 o'clock, we'll wrap it up with a final live with me and a special guest, uh, our three-star VP, Amber Sanders to talk more about how you can join the, the community. So we've got lots left in the day. We'll do another drawing here at the top of the hour. Uh, Dr. Bernadine, Dr. Sandy, Dr. Danny, Dr. Tony, and Brooke, thank you all for being on. This was a wealth of information. And I think, but judging from the comments and the engagement and that we weren't able to get to everything, we may just have to do this again sometime uh, and get everybody back, get the band back together. So. I hope you guys feel the love because it's it's all over. Everybody adores you guys. So thank you so much, so much. We miss everybody. We just love. Our pleasure. Thanks. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. All right. We'll, we'll be back in three minutes. That's right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.